VB to whatever uh, type of um, programming environment you're used to. And in the case statement, I'm doing simple stuff like I'm checking if there's a ladder. Um, and if there's not a ladder, I'm, I'm uh, not doing anything. If, I, uh, if there is a ladder, I'm checking to see if it's a rope type ladder or a ladder type ladder in my game, obviously, um, setting different speeds. You, you notice here, and this is something really, really important. You notice right here I have uh, D-state ladder rope, or D-state ladder. Um, I have a bunch of other states in here, and we'll talk about state machines later, D-state jump. Um, you'll notice if you look at my code, and some of it's maybe not the best. You're always worried about showing your own code, <laughs> right? Because uh, yeah. there comes a point where you just need to get stuff done. Um, but uh, coding in GML, you want to make sure that you're very, very particular on your naming standards. You'll notice a lot of developers or code that you get uh, maybe on forums have a lot of X's and Y's and J's and zeros and ones to stand for stuff. And in a very small game, you can get away with that. But if this is state is equal to three, or state is equal to 16, you know, or whatever, it's, or x is equal to 16, um, it gets to be really, really messy code. So one of the things you want to make sure you do is uh, be very clean in your writing. Mm -hmm. And we can go through this uh, more and more, but you can see how uh, complex uh, this can get uh, going uh, through here. Yeah. So uh, let's go ahead and close this. Um, but again, if you're used to C Sharp or JavaScript, you'll be very comfortable in uh, uh, GML. Oh, um, you can get, uh, uh, oh, actually, that's one thing I wanted to show you. I think I have one in here. Do a control F, uh, show debug message. So uh, this is a really important thing. Uh, one of the things in uh, Game Maker that was a bit challenging to me and maybe challenging to uh, C-sharp developers out there if you're a C-sharp developer, is there's no try-catch. So there's no global catching system that you may be used to. Um, and so you're going to have to spend a lot of time um, doing the, uh, the old ASP.NET uh, response.write uh, type of coding. So you'll see that I have a show debug message. And here I'm passing it, you know, different stuff. This is um, whether it's on a ladder, whether it's not, et cetera. And some of this um, I uncommented out. Um, and I should remove, I re actually removed in, in the main game. And when you do that, it's going to show in this tiny window here. Um, let's see if we have any. So, so these are some debug stuff, the, the object stuff that you see down here. Um, I'll, let me do control four so you guys can see this a bit better. Um, it's not going to mean much to you, but uh, in the compile window down here, not only will it do the compile stuff, uh, but it's also going to show you any debug messages that you want to send up here. Um, I don't see any at the bottom here, but um, that's where it would show off. So that's, that's something you want to make sure that um, you understand and you use regularly because you're not going to be able to, to catch everything. So um, I think for GML, uh, the next thing I actually wanted to show you uh, is to talk about variables. Um, and there's three different uh, types of variables. There's the instance type variables. And let me actually pop something up here. So any variables that I just implicitly declare in here um, will be belong to this instance. So um, I only have one, uh, uh, one player at a time. Um, so there's only going to only be one instance, but I might have more than one monster at a time. And so an instance variable will uh, be part of that instance. Now, if I wanted it to be um, taken away as soon as it's used, um, I can make it a local one. And I don't need it for this, but if I put a var in front of it, it makes it a local variable. Uh, and the local variable um, allows you to uh, get rid of it as soon as you're done with it. Uh, obviously, the cleaner your code, um, the better. Um, the, the better it will run if you don't have things you're not using in memory. And then finally, we have a global variable. Um, so a global variable can get dangerous. Uh, global variables in JavaScript, the same way, um, if you have too many globals, it can get really, really messy. But sometimes you need to, uh, everywhere in your game, see when things are going on. And so you can set a global variable. And quite easily, uh, all you do to set that is do global dot whatever you want to create the variable name is. And it, uh, it allows you to uh, access it from anywhere mm. uh, in the code. And then the final thing, kind of hidden. Um, nope. I don't want to save that. We're going to close this. 
And at the bottom of our tree here, <clears throat> we have what we call uh, macros. And I'll go ahead and open that up. And this is where I'm able to uh, create constants. So um, D state stand is always equal to zero. D state walk is always equal to one. D state climb is always equal to four. You can see I have constants for a ton of stuff. Max uh, H speed, max fall speed, uh, skid speed. Um, and this does two things. One, it creates very clear code. Um, so as I showed you in the code, you can very clearly see that I was looking to see if I was on a ladder, and if I was, I set my state equal to, uh, you know, on a ladder. Um, it also allows you to write code that's not brittle. And what I mean by that is you see I have uh, max uh, horizontal speed set to eight. Well, if I'm setting the max speed in my code a bunch of times to eight, and then somewhere along the line, I decided nine was better, I have to find all those different places in the code to change it. Where uh, with my game, if I wanted to globally change the, the max speed to nine, I play, change it in one place, and I'm done. Um, and so those are macros. And if you are a programmer, these are like using constants. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some things that uh, hopefully uh, can get you started using this. Now, one of the things um, I mentioned uh, in the last section was that um, you saw I had states in there. I had walking state and other state. And even though I called it state, they weren't really state machines. And so I want to quickly cover uh, what state machines and, and how they help you here uh, in, in Game Maker. So let's go ahead and I'm going to open up a really cool game. Some of you might know this, some of you might not. Uh, let's open this one. I wonder if I've seen this. Yeah, game. we will see. Did you make Actually, this one too? I did not make this one. This is a remake of a classic game. So Zool is an old time uh, classic game. And he, Zool just uh, is in Candyland. Yeah. And, yeah, and he has to kill people and grab stuff. And you can see he dies. Um, the reason I, ha reason, reason I have this uh, is there's a, a book out, uh, Game Maker Companion. There's two really good ones, uh, Game Maker Apprentice and Game Maker Pan uh, Companion. Uh, one of them is written by Mark Overmyers, who created Game Maker. Uh, and that's one of the games in it. And uh, inside of it, they actually have, I have a GML version, which is really cool to compare as well, since we're talking about drag and drop versus um, GML. So if you really want to see how to, because this is a very complex game, um, here's a great example. Uh, in Object Zool, um, in his draw event, you can see this is just starts to get uh, crazy and, and farther and farther and farther down. And so one of the things that a lot of game developers do, I actually decided against it. I started with that in Dave and then uh, went away from it, is what's called a state machine. So you can see that there's uh, four different or five different Zools. So there's an Object Zool. Uh, and if you're used to programming, uh, this is like the parent object. Uh, so all the objects above him, so if you look at object Zool land, um, his parent is object Zool. And what that means is everything that happens in that base one will happen in him. But he's the uh, one that's on land. So the, all the code that I have to have in here has to deal with when he's on land, when he's walking, when he's right, when he's left, um, when he's on a ledge, when he's on a ramp. Now the one in the air, um, again, uh, gets his uh, parent from Object Zool, so all that has. But he's only concerned with um, when he's in when he's in the air. So you can see we're setting gravity, we're, we're um, determining when we're actually hitting something, uh, hitting a ledge or going through a ledge. And again, we have one for when he's on a wall and when he's on ice. Um, so that's a state machine, and state machines allow you to another programming thing uh, separate concerns. So it allows you to compartmentalize pieces of your code in a way that doesn't get unwieldy and doesn't get crazy where you can't find stuff. Uh, state machines allow you to switch from state to state and keep what, what has to do with that state in one nice little box. Uh, it also gives you the ability to, uh, like I said, get inheritance in a way by having a uh, parent object like uh, Object Zool. Yeah, that sounds like it would help thing, keep things clear for sure. It, it is and it does. Um, I. When I was working with uh, Dave in the Cave, I originally started with state machines, and I went away from it because 
Um, you have to balance the, the complexity with the jumping back and forth and managing uh, the different states. And so I ultimately decided to have one, as you saw, one object character instead of uh, different states. And I decided to uh, set states using constants. But either way, mine's kind of a, a cheating uh, state machine, I guess you can say, uh, but either way it allowed me to decide what to do with the character depending on what state he was. Um, so that uh, is the, all we had for uh, this module. Um, hopefully it gave you a good uh, indication of um, how to use GML, where to start, you know, have the different baby steps of, of how to get there, um, and actually how to use state machines and, and utilize variables. I um, hope you enjoyed it. We're going to take a quick break and we'll see you back here for the next module. Hey everyone, welcome back to Advanced Techniques for Game Maker. Uh, this is module two, and we're going to be doing animation using Spine. I'm Natalie. This is Daniel. And I'm Daniel Egan. Uh, this should be a pretty fun session today. Um, the agenda for this module is uh, first an introduction to Spine. Um, you might have seen the module title and said, what, you know, what are we doing here? And so I'm going to introduce you to Spine, kind of what it does. Uh, and we're going to then take Spine and uh, create some animations using it. We're going to import the images. We're going to connect the bones. We're going to uh, animate the bones. And again, um, at the top of uh, this module or uh, this uh, collection of modules, we talked about the fact that I'm a developer. Uh, and just like when we drew stuff in Inkscape in the previous ones, um, I'm attacking this from a developer's point of view. So uh, not from an artist, not from an animator's point of view. It's a very powerful tool. But I'm going to show you how you can and simply uh, use it. So um, if you want to uh, play along, if you want to uh, use this after we show it to you, um, you'll want to go to uh, esotericsoftware.com. And so let's go ahead and uh, introduce uh, Spine to you. And I'm going to do that by first going to their Kickstarter page. Because actually, I think this is cool. This is how I uh, come, came to find Spine itself. Um, and Spine was a Kickstarter. A couple guys who were game devs uh, wanted to write a tool that was easy to use uh, and that allowed them to uh, animate uh, characters using uh, a bone and skeletal structure. And you can tell at first they, they were looking for $12,000. And they made much more than $12,000. Yeah, so it was very popular. Um, if you scroll down, and we won't, but you can see their stretch goals and what they wanted to add uh, as they went along, as they kept surpassing uh, what people wanted. Um, some of the cool things like generic uh, JavaScript or generic C++. Um, they have add-ins for C Sharp and onion skinning. And they, I mean, they just kept going, bounding boxes, etc. Um, they were actually so successful, they didn't have to work, uh, and they did this full time. They actually took a, a second Kickstarter out and again um, went above their 20,000 goal. And this was to uh, add uh, additional features to it um, and uh, things that people were really requesting and really needing. So this is a community type of tool, although you will have to pay for it. So I really like this tool. Usually I like showing free tools um, like Inkscape, like Audacity, tools that um, are open source and free. Uh, but these guys are real good community guys. Um, and if we look at this, everything I'm doing today, you'll actually be able to do with the trial. You just won't be able to put it anywhere. You won't be able to export it. Um, you can see that you know the prices for the essential and, and the professional if you want to do that. Um, but you know it's a, I guess it's a small price to pay. At least I feel it's a small price to pay um, if you really uh, start utilizing this and you're really building a game. The amount of time it saved me uh, when I was building Dave in the Cave uh, is is I I couldn't even describe how much money and time it saved me in creating my characters. Actually. I take that back. I can describe that. So let me show you. So uh, here's Dave in Dave in the Cave. And uh, uh, we've seen this before, but this is his uh, walk cycle. So once you actually sit and create the character, um, then you need to animate them. And traditional animation either does a sprite sheet where they're all crammed together, where you have an artist and the same character, it's his running and his jumping and his falling and his kicking and whatever it is. Um, you can have that, or you can have strips. So this is just a running strip. And when I had him running in the game, I had to, let me show you up here, 
I had to figure out like I said, I'm a developer. I had to figure out how do you make a character look like he's running, right? So I just looked up run cycle, and this came up a million times. And I'm like, oh, okay. If I just make him do like that, he'll look like he's running. And that's great. And that's fantastic. And I have a running cycle. But then he had to jump. Then he had to fall. <laughs> then he had to roll. Then I had bats that had to flap their wings. I had spiders that needed to walk around. I had monsters that needed to clomp around. And so being able to finish a game uh, on time using this technique, again, coming from a non-artist, um, started to uh, seem insurmountable to me. So if we flip over to another uh, one that we're gonna look at, this is Little Man. Uh, this is a little guy I created. And you can see that um, we have Little Man in a strip as well. So I created a character that was pretty simplistic. You can see he doesn't have any arms or legs, but you can simulate arms or legs just from the movement of the hands and the movement of the feet, uh, the movement of the sword. I could bob his head up and down. Uh, but still, do, uh, creating a walk cycle or anything like this still takes a little time, not as much as a complex character like Dave, um, but you can see that I've made different versions of him. Yeah, oh. even though his feet are just little shapes, they look like he's walking. It's really realistic. Yeah, I, I love, and I, I personally, um, it's a